Good morning. Welcome to Watanai Church English Service. Let us prepare our heart to worship in spirit and in truth. The call to worship for this morning is from the First Chronicles, chapter six, uh, chapter uh, sixteen, verses thirty-first to thirty-three. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let them say among the nations, "The Lord is King." Let the sea roar, and all that fills in it. Let the field exult, and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. Hymn of preparation, rejoice! The Lord is King. It's always a joy to have each of you here on a Sunday morning. Now let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts, and this is a private moment in our meeting together where we can confess anything that the Holy Spirit reminds us of that needs confessing, bringing to His attention and dealing with it before we proceed in our worship hour. Let's take these few moments now to be quiet before the Lord. As we continue in personal prayer and confession, the assurance of pardon comes to us this morning from Proverbs 
28, verse 13. No one who conceals or hides his transgressions will prosper. But those who confess and forsake them will obtain mercy. Our loving Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we come again in and only through the precious name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. We thank you, loving Father, for all that you have provided for us in your Son, Jesus. And as we bow before you this morning, we thank you again, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done for us in obedience to your Father's eternal and holy will, in providing a place of acceptance, a place of reconciliation, a place of mercy, a place of pardon. We come reverently, but with joy, with confidence, because you, the Holy One, the Eternal, Almighty, Sovereign of the Universe, you have invited us to come because of Jesus. And so we come to bow, to kneel, to worship, to acknowledge you again, individually and collectively, who you are. Then, Lord, as we continue in your presence in prayer, we do want to remember our pastor and the pastoral team and the elders of this congregation, the Sunday school teachers, the classes that are taking place right now. We ask, gracious Lord, that you would be among them even as we know that you are among us by your Spirit. We remember those, Lord, who are going through a time of suffering, of difficulty, of tension, of confusion, maybe even of darkness, There are some today who have attended our service who are in situations that are very difficult. We remember them this morning in the name of Jesus. We pray, gracious Lord, for those who are in immigration detention or in any other capacity where they are not free to move about, to travel, and to attend our service and worship together. We lovingly commit them to you this morning and for this day, and pray, gracious Lord, that you, by your Spirit, will draw very near to them. Touch their hearts, that they may in spite of their situation, lift their hearts to you in prayer, in worship, and even in praise. We continue to thank you, Lord, for the peace in the land, 
And again, we ask that your people, including all of us here this morning, may take the opportunity to bear witness to your love, to your grace, and to share your message of salvation with those who are willing to listen. There are many other needs that jump to mind, but we gather them all up this morning, Lord, and commit them to you and ask in Jesus' name that you, by your Spirit, will be meeting every need. We do commit our dear brother to you who has come to minister your word. We thank you for him and the family. We commit them lovingly to you again this morning. And pray, gracious Lord, that your anointing and power will be upon him. Now let's take a moment to repeat together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Forever. Amen. Can we try one more time and lift the roof a little? Amen. That sounds a little better. I'm sure the Lord is glorified in the worship and praise of his people. Let's just take a few seconds to turn and greet one another. A Thai Y is very convenient, but if you're close enough, you want to shake hands and uh, say a word, why you can just say, may the peace and the blessing of God be with you. I will Y everybody. It's very convenient. The Lord bless you this morning. I would like us to remember, I got news this week, that hundreds of Pakistani immigrants have been arrested, and quite a number of those who have been coming to our morning service are not here this morning, partly for that reason. I called one brother who normally comes regularly and has been attending our Sunday morning Bible class after lunch, and he's hiding out in Pattaya with a friend that took sympathy on his situation. How much longer he can hide out, I don't know. But I have spoken with several that they do need to remain on the right side of the law. And I know in some cases it's difficult because they don't have the finances to deal with their immigration uh, documents. But I said, well, you need to remember that, or you should have remembered and thought about that before you jumped into the fire. We have an expression in English. Some people, they jump, they're in a frying pan. We all know what a frying pan is. I was going to go into Thai, but never mind. They jump from the frying pan into the fire, which basically means they're in one hot place, but because they feel uncomfortable, they jump, but they jump into a hotter place. And uh, this is what some of them have done, unfortunately, but we do want to remember them uh, in love, in the love of Christ, and in sympathy. I share that with you for your prayers throughout this coming week. If you are in any way able to help, then I'm sure our brothers and or sisters would be very, very grateful. Let's turn to the back of our bulletin now very quickly. I don't want to take too much time from our uh, speaker, but we do have a couple of prayer requests and a couple of praise items. Let me remind you once again that there are slips of paper in your bulletin, the purpose of which is to record 
any prayer requests that you may have and any praise items so that we may share those with you. Not only today, but we'll take them home and pray and praise during the week. Let's pray for Raisat Masi and his family, asylum seekers. Pray that God will meet their needs. There are quite a number. We could add to this at least 15, 20 names. But God knows who they are. God knows where they are. Our Father knows what their needs are. So let's remember them. If we have one name. If you know of any other names, I trust that you can remember those names before the Lord. We are facing a hard situation in Bangkok. We are from Pakistan. Please pray for us. And this can be repeated by many. This is Prinsella. I'm not sure who Priscilla is, but if, are you here this morning? No? All right. That's understandable. Let's remember our brothers and sisters in prayer. And together we'll praise him, for he is worthy to be praised. Praise him for his life, gift of life to us day by day. Let's pray, pray and praise together. Our loving Heavenly Father, you know the needs that each one of us represent here this morning. We are a needy people. Whether we like to acknowledge that or not, we are needy. We pray, Lord, again especially for these who are in places of discomfort, places of fear. And we ask, Lord, this morning again that in Jesus' name you would be among those who are really trusting you and are seeking to follow you in spite of their situations this morning. For each one of us here this morning, we commit one another to you in the name of Jesus again and look to you, Father, to be meeting the needs that we represent, whether they are physical needs, spiritual needs, financial needs, needs of guidance, counsel, whatever our needs may be this morning, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you, by your Spirit, will be meeting the needs of each one of us and those that we represent, our families, our friends, our loved ones. We commit ourselves now to you and thanking you, Lord, that you are here by your Spirit. Minister to us in power and in blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading for this morning comes from the letter to Philippians, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 11. Salutation. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishop and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer for the Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight, 
to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The title of sermon for this morning is The Life of a True Christian Life, delivered by Reverend Dr. Stephen, uh, Dr. Steve Taylor. Everybody, it's very nice to be here again this morning with you. Um, I've entitled a sermon this morning, The Life of the True Christian. And how do we know what a true Christian looks like? Uh, how can we determine if a person is really on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because the foundation of the Christian life is by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. And many things that we can look at, we can see whether they're real or false. Uh, for instance, the Thai identity card. Is this one real or false? Or should it be like this? Which one is real or false? Even the Thai people, I think, some are questioning. <laughs> well, the correct one is the one below. The picture should be on the right-hand side uh, if it's a real Thai identity card. What does the normal Christian, or what does the true Christian look like? In our reading in Philippians, uh, we read about how Paul thanks, the, thanks God for the Christians in Philippi because they genuinely had a burden for the gospel in verse 5. Uh, Paul thanks God that he who began a good work in you in verse 6. And then reading on, uh, he says how I have you in my heart in verse 7. And he then prays for them various things that may be evident in their lives. And the last phrase in these verses, he concludes with to the glory and praise of God. And the reason why this is significant is because all religions center on what we do for some religion, but the Christian faith centers on what God does. God is the center, and all is to His praise. He is the one that begins a good work in us. He is the one that completes it. The true Christian is one where God is the foundation of everything. It's not so much what we do, in order to be a Christian. It's what God does in us and makes us in His name. So, therefore, I've entitled my sermon, The Life of the True Christian. What does he look like or what does she look like? The first point that I want to emphasize this morning is in verse 6, that it started and completed by God Himself. He is the one that begins so in verse 6, we say, we read that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The first evidence of being a true Christian is that the work began with God's work in you, not with you yourself. Uh, Paul saw this in the Philippians. And we know how they, they, they started their Christian faith in Acts 16, verse 12 to 15. Uh, we read, from there we travel to Philippi. Um, and it's we because Luke also was with Paul at this stage in the journey. So we travel to Philippi. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia. The Lord opened her heart. This is the point that I'm wanting to make here. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. She and the members of her household were baptized. When God is at work, many things happen. Uh, when man tries to do something, it's often very difficult 
and with many problems. Even when God does something, there's often many problems, but we start to see things happening. And if we're helping a new Christian, when God is at work in their life, it's very easy to help them because we see that God is preparing their hearts. God is opening their heart, just like He opened the heart of Lydia, and things happen. In Thailand, there are two types of soldier. There's the conscript and there's the volunteer. So every boy, at when they're aged 20 or 21, I think it's 21, they must, uh, they must present themselves and either they, they, they choose the red or the black card and that decides whether they're going to be a soldier. That's the conscript. Uh, but there's the, the type of soldier where people decide that that's the kind of career that they want, to be a soldier. And so they're a volunteer and then they're employed as a soldier. Um, what kind of, when we're thinking about the Christian faith, how did we become a Christian? Was it like being a conscript or a volunteer? Well, in the context of what I'm saying, I want to suggest that it's like we are conscripted. God appoints us. God works in us. God draws us. God opens our heart and helps us to believe. Uh, yes, we volunteer also. It's not that we're forced, but God is the one that chooses us and decides that we're going to come to Him. And I wonder if you sense that in you when you look back how you began your Christian faith. It was God who began a good work in you. Because God doesn't look at… The, the word in English is election. God chooses us. He appoints us. Um, it's not that God, uh, when we chose Him, but we read that you did not choose me, but I chose you. Um, and this is the amazing thing that God began a good work in us. Um, when I was a boy, my mother put this picture on the end of my bed. It's a picture of Jesus knocking at the door, wanting to come in to the person's life. Uh, you'll notice there's no handle on the door. He doesn't force his way in, but he knocks, he knocks, he knocks, he knocks. And ever since I was a small boy, I could hear Jesus knocking at the door of my life, uh, wanting to come in, wanting to be the center of my life, wanting to be Lord of my life. But through my teenage years, I resisted. I wanted just, just to live my own life. But nevertheless, I could still hear him knocking at the door of my life until I was 18 uh, in Liverpool. Um, after I moved from Liverpool to Manchester, I was a university student. And the first year of being a university student, I opened the door of my life and Jesus came in to my life. But the point I want to make is that it's His initiative. He's the one that's knocking. He's the one who starts a good work in us. And it's by His grace that He chooses us. It's not because of anything that's good in us that He elects us or chooses us. It's purely because of His grace. It's not that God has a pair of scales and weighs our good against our evil. And if we have more good than evil, then He will choose us. No. Uh, God doesn't have a picture of scales. God has the picture of the cross, which eliminates all sense of merit from our side, but it's purely by His grace. And throughout the book of Ephesians, we see that it's God's initiative, God who began a good work. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 6, the verse that we read, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. In chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, we read, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Beloved, if we just read verse 12 alone, we would think it, it, it's our own effort. 
But no, we must look on to verse 13, where he gives the reason. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. This is the picture of the true Christian. God's initiative, he's always working in us. He's always calling us. He's always drawing us. Or in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And I've had that sense ever since a boy. God was taking hold of me, started by knocking. When I received him into my life, he took hold of me in order to lead me on. This is, should be the picture in our own life that we sense God's hand on our lives. Do you sense this in your life? Because this is what gives us assurance of salvation. God is in control of me. It gives us the assurance of completion. How can we be sure that we'll reach the finishing post? Uh, how can we be sure that we'll carry on living in Him to the end day, to our, the end of our days? Uh, we can be sure that because He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. He will bring it to completion. Or in chapter 8 of Romans, we read, God foreknew He predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, so that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined or elected, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. It's God's work from beginning to end. So how do you know you'll, you'll, you'll get to the finishing line? It's not because you determine to get to the finishing line. It's because God determines that you will get to the finishing line. He's in control of your life. Now, how does He do this? Well, this is the second point, and we'll be a bit shorter in our second and third point. The second point I want to make is that He places us in hearts, or we're placed in hearts. Not only it's God's initiative from the beginning, but when God does something, He puts what He wants to do in the hearts of people. And this, by this, we can be sure that this is a genuine work of God, or we are a genuine work of God. Uh, in verse 7, we read, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. The Philippian Christians were placed by God into Paul's heart. And this made Paul confident that they're the real thing, they're really a work of God, because they've been put in his heart. In verse 8, Paul can say that God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And we see this when God is doing a work for instance, he was going to create the nation of Israel. What did he do? He put a burden in the heart of Abraham to leave his home and to go from Ur of the Chaldees to a place that God had determined for him. And from this one man, Abraham, God formed a nation. But he started by putting it into Abraham's heart. didn't start from Abraham. God placed it there, and Abraham then responded in faith, and that formed the foundation of what God was going to do from that point. Um, this is the thing that I want us to see, that when God is working in somebody's life, He's working in your life, He'll put you in the hearts of others. And sometimes He puts others in our hearts, too. This is a firm assurance that these are things that God is doing. Uh, we should be sensitive to the burdens that He gives us and the people that He gives us a burden for because these are people that God is at work in. They're real. They're the real thing. They're the real Christians. Um, 
When I became a Christian at 18, when I was a student, I was in Manchester, um, and then I went back to Liverpool, where I grew up as a boy, and because my mother was a Christian, she had taken me to church as a boy, but when I was a teenager, I stopped going to church. And, but when I became a Christian at 18, I went back to the church where I grew up, and there was one little old lady there named Miss Grimwood. She had never married. She was about 80 years old at that time. And I shared in the church how I'd become a Christian. And she came up to me at the end of the service, and she said to me, Steve, do you know I have prayed for you every day of your life since you were born? And that really made an impression on me, that God had put me on her heart, and she had prayed for me every day of her life until I became a Christian. This is what God does when he's doing something. He puts people on hearts. Who has he put on your heart? And for sure, you are on the hearts of some people too. And we should recognize that. Um, what God starts, so what God starts, he completes. Started and completed by God. He places us on hearts. And then finally, the true Christian is one who has a faith which bears fruit. There's an evidence of their faith. Uh, when God has started something, we see its evidence in practice. And Paul was confident that God was doing a genuine work in the lives of the Philippians because he saw that their faith was evidenced by works. In verse 5, he thanks God because of your partnership, because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And this is what a real Christian looks like. Even right from the beginning of their Christian life, they start to have a burden for the things of God, for God's kingdom. They want to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. They have a burden and almost they don't need to be told to give their offering. It's not that we give the offering because it's a law uh, or because the church tells us to. It's because we have a real desire to have a partnership in what God's doing in the gospel. And Paul saw this in the Philippian Christians. Um, he saw it evidenced by works. In verse 9, he says, you will love more and more. Is this a characteristic of us as a true Christian, that we're loving more and more? Um, it's not because we try and love, because, but because Christ is in us and revealing his love. It's the fruit of the Spirit coming forth from our lives more and more. In verse 10, you will be able to discern what is best. You know, the true Christian is somebody who's in touch with God's Spirit, and God speaks to them. And by that, they're able to discern what is best in their lives. Very often, as human beings, we don't know what is best. We don't know what the best choice to make is. How can we go through our lives and come to the end of our lives and have no regrets for the decisions that we make? By listening to what God says that we'll be able to discern what is best. I can honestly say that now I'm 60, 61, just turned 61, but my wife and I, we've been serving for 35 years now in Thailand. Um, I became a Christian since I was 18. As I look back on my life, I have no regrets. Because always, especially in the larger decisions, always sought to know what God's will is. And he enables us to be sure of what's best. And so we have no regrets as we look back on our life in the decisions that we've made because we've always sought to seek God's purpose, God's will. We've been able to discern what is best. Uh, it may not always mean that we 
make the most money. Certainly as a missionary, I've not made as much money by deciding to move out of my work as an engineer. But I've never regretted the decision. It's been able to discern what's best, what God, God's best for you is. This is the true Christian, in touch with God, and God speaks to them. In verse 10, being pure and blameless. And verse 11, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Are we becoming more and more pure, um, even as we judge ourselves? Are we seeing that transformation in our lives? James says that faith without works is dead. It's not that we believe 10 years ago, but there's no evidence now of faith, but because I believe 10 years ago, then I'm safe. No, the Bible doesn't affirm or give assurance to that, but true faith works. True faith is evidenced by works, something that comes out from our lives. The assurance of salvation now is that God has started something in us, and it's evidenced by works, things that are coming forth from our lives. Um, so twice in our passage, Paul refers to the day of Christ, that God will keep you up until that day. You will have a faith that's living up until that day when Jesus comes. Jesus came 2,000 years ago in order to bring salvation, and he will come again to judge to judge everybody, including Christians too. In Matthew 25, verse 32, we read, all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. In Revelation 20, verse 13, each person will be judged according to what he has done. It's interesting here, it's not according to grace or according to faith, but it's according to what is done. Actually, there's no uh, problem here uh, because it's the works that are evidence, that are evidence of faith. It's faith being worked out in practice. It's the fact that our faith is worked out in practice, finally, that will show that we are the true Christian. So here, Paul is looking at their partnership in the gospel, their love abounding more and more, discerning what is best, being pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness. And God is at work in you to produce these fruits in your life. It's like a picture of gold being refined. And this is a picture of the true Christian life. It's not an easy life. God is at work in us to produce fruit from our lives, to produce holiness. Um, I just have a short clip of how they refine gold. So just have a look at how they refine the gold, if this will play. Hopefully it will play. It's not playing. Can you try pressing? No, it's not playing. Never mind. But it shows how they refine the gold through a furnace and through the heat. Then it comes out pure gold or 99.9% .9 gold. Um, oh, here. And the finished product is quite beautiful. And that's a picture of what God is doing in our lives in order to produce that fruit, the fruit of righteousness in our lives. It's God's work in us. Um, it's the, the point that I'm making is that grace and judgment go together, that God elects us. He draws us to himself by grace. It's not by anything within us. But then as we come to him, 
we allow his judgment to come upon us, that he, he, it's like a refining fire, that he burns out those things that are not correct in our lives. This is the true picture of the Christian life, grace and judgment going together, him burning out what's wrong, sometimes through trials, sometimes through hardship, uh, sometimes through failure, sometimes through sickness, uh, whatever God deems fit in order to use as a furnace, but we must submit ourselves to the furnace of God. So just in summary, the life of the true Christian, it started and completed by God. It's uh, the, the true life is started and completed by God, placed in the hearts of others, and he places people in our hearts, and it's a faith which bears fruit. Is this a picture, as we thought this morning, of your life? Can you sense that this is God's work in you and what He's doing in order to produce, just like that pure gold, uh, for His glory? Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning that We've been able to look at these verses in Philippians, and just as they applied to the Christians 2,000 years ago, they apply in the same way to us today, that you've started a work in us. Lord, thank you that it doesn't come from our own effort, even from our own goodness, because we don't have any, yet because of your grace. And Lord, you placed us on the hearts of others. Others join in, in seeing what you're doing in us and have a part in seeing us moving forward to a faith that produces fruit. Lord, we pray that for each one of us, this would be reality in our lives. We commit each other to you today. We especially commit those that feel in the furnace at the moment and the pain and the trials that they're going through. Lord, pray that you would bring your comfort to and the knowledge that you're producing pure gold. You're producing that life of righteousness that pleases you. Lord, we commit each other to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord for his word that have come to us this morning. Offertory, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. We will remain seated as we sing to him, Jesus, keep me near the cross.
Let's all stand to sing and let's sing the doxology together. together. Our loving Father, again, we thank you for your word to our hearts this morning. Thank you for the faithfulness of our dear brother in sharing with us your word. We grant, Lord, that throughout this coming week, we may demonstrate to you and to those around us that we really belong to you and that we are samples, Lord, of your working in us and through us that you may be glorified in each one of us. Now may the grace of God the Father, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us throughout these coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go into this coming week, we do not know, as the scriptures remind us, what a day will bring forth. But we know that if we're in God's hands, we need never fear. We can trust. We can walk. We can live by faith in a way that will honor him, and bring joy to our hearts and to the hearts of those among whom we live. The Lord bless you. Keep praying, keep trusting, keep walking in the name of Jesus. Amen.